critical function. First, we're going to do a little bit about the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is this year. And uh, there we have it, the Hubble Space Telescope floating out in orbit around the Earth. It's been up there now for 25 years. And uh, it, oh, it took uh, quite an effort to get up there. Uh, and when, we, when it finally made it up there, the, we found out that the optics were somewhat flawed, as you remember. And then after five servicing missions, uh, we now have an amazing observatory. We still have an amazing observatory in space. So let me just, we'll just start right off here. The first mission to put Hubble into space was in April 25th, 1990. And this was uh, STS-31, uh, which was the 31st, well, actually it wasn't the 31st mission, but it was numbered the 31st mission of the space shuttle. And uh, that it was the uh, uh, inaugural mission where they actually deployed the space telescope. So that was its primary, thank you, that was its primary mission was to deploy the uh, space uh, telescope. And uh, here is the space telescope being deployed. Oops, skipped a slide there. <coughs> And you can see the, the shutter is closed at the front of the telescope. And this was when the Hubble telescope still had these really wobbly solar cell panels on it, which were replaced in, a, in the uh, first servicing mission. But you can see there the Canada arm has just grasped the telescope and placed it gingerly just outside the reach of the shuttle. And then they will move the shuttle away slowly. And, and uh, then they would open that door on the front of the Hubble Space Telescope, and they gave it first light, and were just a little disappointed in what they saw. <laughs> oh, well. So it took another five servicing missions. And that wasn't just to correct the, 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 the vision of the Hubble Space Telescope. But you can see that there were lots of missions here. The STS-61 was the first servicing mission in 1993. And that's where they put that. Uh, the corrective optics, the, the, the eyeglasses for Hubble onto the telescope. And uh, that's, uh, it was a, uh, an instrument called COSTAR. And uh, uh, so that uh, corrected the vision of the Hubble telescope, not only for the camera, but for a lot of the other instrumentation on the, uh, the uh, telescope itself. And these other servicing missions did other things, replacing gyroscopes and replacing, fixing power supplies. And they did an amazing amount of work from the shuttle. It was really a, quite a really advanced what NASA could do in space, servicing this uh, space telescope. And the last one uh, was service mission uh, one, tw uh, servicing mission four. <coughs> They're numbered one, two, three, A, three, B, and four, oddly, I don't know why. Um, uh, and that was in 2005. I, had, I was really lucky. I got to go and see the launching for servicing mission 3B and <coughs> servicing mission 4. I think I need a glass of water. Oh, you poured some for me. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, and if you ever have a chance to go to Cape Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center, and see a launch, you can't see a launch of a shuttle anymore, but, and see a launch of anything, I highly encourage you to go and do that. It's really an amazing sight to see. So in prep for all of these missions, we did a lot of webcasting of how the astronauts get ready to do these things as well. And so we had an opportunity not only to watch them launch, but also to go and experience where the astronauts study. And one of the places they study, I'm wearing the t-shirt from it, is something called the, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Every, anyone can get a Hubble t-shirt. This is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab t-shirt. And the Neutral Buoyancy Lab really is a gigantic swimming pool. Uh, and here is the, where the astronauts practice maneuvering things in, well, zero-g-like conditions. So they put the astronauts in the water in their spacesuits. And then they're surrounded by divers who kind of juggle the astronauts around and hang little weights from them so they don't rotate around. They don't go down head first or feet first. Or they can, they're, they're perfectly stable whichever direction they point them. This takes about a half of an hour to, to manipulate astronauts in the water and do this. And meanwhile, the astronauts are just sort of laying around doing not a whole lot. <clears throat> and then they can go underneath the water. And you can see here there's two 
I have my pointer here. There's two uh, cylindrical objects. This one here is the lower part of the shuttle, uh, and this is for the upper part of the, the uh, sorry, the upper lower part of the space telescope and the upper part of the space telescope. It's cut, cut in half because the pool is only 40 feet deep. Um, and by the way, the clearest water I have ever seen. Um, they wouldn't let us jump in. Uh, we'd, we wanted to. <clears throat> and then the astronauts here can practice doing these maneuvers in a relatively zero-g environment. Um, here they are. Um, uh, manipulating inside a simulation of the shuttle uh, bay right here, and then here's the space telescope which is mounted on a, on a ring. Uh, so uh, here they are. This, I did not take this picture, uh, but I could have taken it through a window. They do have windows looking into the uh, neutral buoyancy tank. Uh, and there you can see the astronauts uh, practicing and they practice and practice and practice and practice. We also got to interview some of the astronauts above the, uh, the uh, pool as well. This is uh, John Grunsfeld that uh, Mary Miller is, is interviewing there. He's actually in charge of uh, NASA science now. He was just an astronaut back then, and he has been on most of these servicing missions. The Hubble Space Telescope is controlled, not from Houston. It's controlled from um, Baltimore at the Hubble Space Space Telescope Science Institute, and here's the rather modest control room of the Hubble Telescope. It's not this giant thing that you imagine that we are used to seeing from Apollo and, and all the other missions. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly modest room. And uh, this was, uh, I think, again, during one of the servicing missions, and there you can see the shuttle is on the launch pad on the, on the big screen back there. So what has Hubble seen in its time looking out at the universe? It looks very near and it looks very far. Some of the near things that the Hubble has looked at are planets in our own solar system. Uh, here is a view of Mars from the Hubble Space Telescope. The left-hand picture here you can see is a nice clear picture of Mars. You can see polar ice caps. And then the right-hand picture there is actually Mars uh, at the same resolution, but it's during one of these global dust storms. Uh, these huge dust storms kick up on Mars and, and really uh, cover the entire planet. Uh, a little further out, let's one more one planet out. Next planet is Jupiter. Jupiter thank you. <laughs> Jupiter. So here is Jupiter, and uh, this is an amazing view from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is better than the view we got from the very first probes that flew by the planet Pioneer 10 and 11. And, uh, and here you see, uh, uh, this is not a, a 2001, oh my God, it's full of stars <laughs> thing going on there. That's a shadow of a moon passing over uh, Jupiter and it's passing right over the great red spot. Now this is of course a black and white picture. All the pictures that the Hubble takes, by the way, are in black and white. And then you have to reconstruct them in color. So they're black and white pictures, but taken through various colored filters. And then you take all these black and white pictures and you bring them into, yes, Photoshop, actually. And <laughs> believe it or not, and actually, uh, we're going to have the guy that puts together all the photographs that you're about to see, Zoltan LeVay, is going to be here. What's the date on that? May 7th. May 7th. He's going to give a talk here at the Exploratorium. So if you want to actually talk to the guy that makes a lot of those photos, come on May 7th and we'll do a little, we're going to do a little webcast. So um, and he's, a, he's a really uh, interesting fellow. Uh, I encourage you to come and see him. Uh, moving one more planet out. Saturn. Saturn, very good. I'm so happy that you guys know this. <laughs> we can see, actually this is an animation of the moons of Saturn, since they're in the same plane as the rings, they cast shadows just on Saturn, just like they do on uh, Jupiter, but they also cast shadows on the rings. And this was the first time that this was seen. I just wanted to show you this animation because it's so cool. So look, see these little stripes right here? Those are the shadows of those moons on the rings of Saturn. Then you can see the shadows on the planet itself. This is a time lapse. This is a time, shot? yes, it's a time lapse. Just amazing stuff. Is that a string? There? No, that's the straw. Wow. You can use your microphone. You're recording. Yeah, you want me on? Yeah, I want you on the recording. Yes, I do, Linda. You're an important part of the show here. I was told not to swear. Little further out. <laughs> the whole internet is going to see you. There's a potential audience of 7 billion people for this oh, webcast. I'll behave. Yes. 
which is only a small part of the population of the universe, of course. So looking even further out, Hubble saw uh, amazing things. When I was a kid and, and I, we saw all these beautiful pictures come from observatories on the Earth, like from the 200-inch Palomar telescope, things like the Horsehead Nebula. The Horsehead Nebula looks something like this. And these were beautiful pictures, but this is not a Hubble picture. Mm -hmm. A Hubble picture actually uh, is going to look more like this. This is a, uh, an animation, actually, t using the data from the Hubble and using the 3D data. They were actually, this is the same nebula, and you can see it's a dark cloud. That dark horse's head that you saw on the previous slide is actually a huge cloud that's blocking the light from stars behind it. But here in this picture, taken in infrared light, you can actually sort of see the shape of the horse's head in almost in 3D. So if the colors are in black and white, if the images are in black and white, how do they know how to color it? Well, uh, they take the pictures through three different colored filters, a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter, and then they can put those back together. You can put them, composite them one on top of the other transparently, and uh, oops, okay. <laughs> this is a nice little ad. So, uh, we've all seen uh, gorgeous pictures of the Orion Nebula, or some of us have even seen it through a telescope, but Hubble gave us this amazing view of the Orion Nebula M42. This is the uh, nursery of stars here. Stars are being born here. You can see that in the front there, those dark clouds. These are actually very dense clouds that are not allowing the light from behind to come through. And then the nursery is sort of in the middle right here. And if you take a look at this with a telescope, you can see the stars in the middle there. And there's a little uh, trapezium of stars in there. It's called the trapezium. <laughs> Astronomers are not very good at naming things. The big red spot on Jupiter is called what? The great red spot, yes. So uh, other nebulas that we're seeing, uh, the Ring Nebula was a, just looked like in the Palomar telescope, just like a ring, slightly colored, but the Hubble did this beautiful, unbelievable picture of uh, the Ring Nebula. All these little details that you see here, these little dark globules here were not visible originally in the uh, photographs that we got when I got, as a, that I got as a kid. And now we see this amazing thing. We also see these rings around the outside, previous puffs of gas. The star in the middle is dying and it's puffing out its outer atmospheres. And that puff that we see here is being lit by the newly exposed hot core of that star and causing that gas to glow. Just beautiful stuff. It looks like the mineral pools at Yellowstone it a little does, bit. It does, doesn't it? It does at that. I just, I just love this picture. I could look at that all night, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, we've all seen that the very first spectacular picture that was returned by Hubble was of the Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation. Those aren't the only pillars. You find these pillars in a lot of nebula. Here's one in one called, odd, oddly enough, the Monkey Head Nebula. And so let's zoom in on that. So here is, you see Orion to the right and Gemini to the left. And we're going to zoom in on an area that's sort of between them there. And as we zoom in, that's kind of an Earth-based telescope picture. You can get an idea of the small piece of the sky that the Hubble actually does look at. And we're beginning to see some of the pillars there. Oh, wow. So there is, the, and those pillars are being evaporated by stars in their tips. So they're actually being eroded down, just like the ones in the Eagle Nebula are. So here again, they've taken the data and they can kind of give you a semi-3D view of this. Okay, where's the monkey head? I don't see a monkey here. Anybody see a monkey head? There's <laughs> probably spider nebula too. Another one of my favorite deaths of star nebulae that uh, Hubble has shown is one called Eta Carina. And this is a, a star that is uh, kind of violently uh, shed it, um, a lot of its mass. Oop, come on, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button there. There we go. Mm. This is Eta Carina, and that, I mean, if that doesn't say violence to you, nothing does. The star has uh, pushed away its outer layers in the last parts of its life and pushed them out in these two blobs of gas, and this star gets brighter and dimmer with a regularity. That happens every once in a while, so um, it's really an amazing... What's uh, the scale on that? I, I mean, have no idea what the scale of that big, is. Big, really. It's huge. Giant. Don't, do not approach. <laughs> okay, let's go, let's leave our galaxy and look at out 
galaxies that are outside ours. Again, kind of a, a, an earlier view, this is called the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. Mm. And uh, this was kind of the pictures that I grew up with. Mm. And then Hubble uh, released this somewhat improved view of the uh, galaxy. And here you can see lots of interesting things. You can see the stars in the central part of the galaxy are kind of yellow orangey. They're older stars. And the stars in the spiral arms are kind of bluish. They're younger stars. The younger stars are in the spiral arms. And you see all these red nebulae. We look out and we see things like the Orion Nebula. Well, if you were outside our galaxy, those nebulae would be these, these reddish things that you see here. Just incredible views from the Hubble. And a little satellite galaxy over here, too. Uh, another one that was named probably appropriately, um, well, besides M104, this is a Hubble view of the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, yeah. It actually, in the older pictures, it looks more like a sombrero than in this one. This is a galaxy that has a very large core, very large spherical core, and then it has this disk with a lot of dark, very dense gas that blocks the light from behind it. All the other stars you see in this picture are in our galaxy. We're looking through them. And these, those ob that object, this you can go see in a, in a uh, amateur telescope, and you'll see that dark stripe across the center of the galaxy. So using uh, simulations, computer simulations, you can simulate galaxy collisions, and then go out and look for things that look like your computer is, has simulated. So that's what they've done here. So here's a computer simulation of two galaxies colliding. The stars interact gravitationally. It, it, galaxies get pulled apart. So here's the real thing. So we're going to go from simulation to real. Isn't that cannibalism? Galactic cannibalism? Yes, it is. Milky Way is going to be. They're beginning to interact. Notice the stars are being pulled out there. OK, let's see that in reality now. A line and there it is in reality. Wow. That's our fate, isn't it? Yes, it is. We're approaching the Andromeda galaxy. Now they're getting really stretched out of shape. Can we see that in reality? Yes, wow. we can. <laughs> probably don't want to be in these galaxies. Probably a lot, probably a lot of energetic gamma x-rays going around these galaxies. So there's another later phase. And do we see that? We do see that. But these are all different galaxies. Yes, those are all di Yeah, we don't see this actually happening, because this happens over a period of hundreds of millions of years. I just think the simulation is just beautiful. Amazing. Oh, wait a minute. It takes a lot of computing power to simulate that kind of thing, because there's millions of stars in the simulation. Here's a picture of another one that I just really love, too, the colliding galaxies. Just amazing stuff. You can see it's pulled the gas from, like, that, that uh, dark gas band we saw in the sombrero. It's mm -hmm. pulled it out here, and it's now present out here between the two galaxies. So we can look out and see not just one galaxy at a time, but Hubble can look out and see many galaxies at a time. And so this next slide actually is a slide of virtually everything you see here except these things with the spikes on them. Those are stars in our galaxy, but everything else in this slide is a galaxy. It's so uh, that's my favorite. Millions of galaxies. And this isn't even the more. This isn't even the most. Uh, oh. You know we're going to get there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but here, what I wanted to point out here is you'll notice that you see these little um, arcs right here, these arcs. These are, gravi these, these are galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed mm. by this galaxy right here, which is closer than the f these galaxies behind it. And it's bent the light around and creates a gravitational lens, which is really beautifully seen in this uh, uh, slide here. And then what Linda it loves is this, which is the Hubble, the Hubble Deep Field, the Ultra like Deep Field. There was the Hubble ultra. Deep Field, and then they produced the Hubble Ultra, ultra Deep Field. It'll be yes. the super ultra. So the Ultra Deep Field is a very small patch of the sky. And I think we're going to zoom in here. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to zoom in in 3D. That's actually yeah. even better, because they know the distances of all these galaxies. So here we're going to fly through the Hubble Deep Field. And everything you see there is a galaxy. And it's a very small piece of the sky. It's less than your, your little thumbnail held, held out at arm's length. Actually, uh, a lot less than so that. So this is repeated all around the sphere. Of, yes. Um, Everywhere in the sky, you look, you would see something like this. It's incredible. 
Yes, they chose a place that was not in the Milky Way, so it's looking out, you can look out beyond the Milky Way with this. So they chose a spot looking polar opposite. And we'll talk more about that because we're gonna we're gonna go there. Yay. Put your seatbelts on. Okay. And the last slide I want to show you in this presentation is the one they chose just yesterday to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Hubble. This is the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. slide, and it has a little bit of everything in it. You can see here that there's a beautiful cluster of stars over sort of uh, to the right of center, and then there's this beautiful, and th that's, those stars were born out of the gas that you see in the rest of the nebula. It's being lit to glowing by, the, uh, by, those, by that cluster, but this nebula, and look at, you can see the pillars, see the pillars in that nebula too? And those, those uh, actually, you know, I don't, this, I don't even know the name of this, it doesn't have a name. It's a very small piece of the sky, it doesn't have a name except for a long list of numbers, which I didn't write down, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> you can go on the Hubble site, hubblesite.org, and uh, look this up, it's the newest picture up there. It's just beautiful, uh, has a little, like I say, it has a little bit of everything. You see hot, young blue stars. You see, uh, and it's like, this is kind of a combo too. This is a combination of an infrared picture, which lets you look through dust, and a visible picture, which lets you see the dust and the, and the nebulae. So it's just a beautiful shot, um, and this is the one to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Hubble. 